And so the journey on our trusty vessel continues. For those who missed last week's episode, we better start with a recap. Sounds like a detective drama. Previously on a river somewhere. Tom and I had heard of a beautiful river on the far northeastern coast of Australia. With no roads that even came close, the only way there was to sail. And one night we decided, with the help of a little bottled optimism, to do just that. Whatever logistical and practical difficulties we face seem to be dissolved by the sea air. The magnificent conditions help too. And besides, if the stories proved to be true, the journey would be worth it just to see the Arakai. It's probably worth pointing out some of the geography of Australia's Cape York. Our destination was the Yarrakai River. Its mouth is just below Cape Grenville. Our starting point was Port Douglas. And having stopped off at Cape Tribulation, Hope Island and Cooktown, we were now safely moored in the waters north of Cape Bedford. So, with quite a few days sailing ahead of us, we probably should have set sail at dawn but we decided that the spectacular sand dune country just had to be explored. What was interesting was that the entire place, every bush and shrub, sits on a bed of pure white sand and every ridge and valley are just folds in the dunes. It's funny though, they didn't look so big from the boat. Yep, I thought they did. You've actually got to turn your head around a couple of times to take in the dimensions of this place. All these pure white sand sand dunes. And it was not lost on Cook either. He noted in the journal that this area will be useful only if they build a glass house. Well, Cape Flattery up there is the site of a sand mine. Apparently it's one of the purest sands in the world. It's then shipped off to Asia. Cook ran into a bit of trouble off here and so he used these two capes to navigate his way all the way up through the reef which is exactly what we're doing. Before we headed back down to the boat there was one thing we wanted to try. So we hiked over to the biggest steepest dune we could find and then climbed up its entire face. Now we'd like to say we did this for scientific or historical purposes but we didn't. We just wanted to act like Galahs. And I think we succeeded. It's the sort of place where they invent extreme sports or film soft drink commercials. But if you ever do make it here, I highly recommend you act like a Galah instead. The rest of that week would see us ride the constant southeasterlies and move further on up the coast. Me working on a tan, Rob working on his Dennis Connor impersonation. We basically had to put in some pretty big days at sea. The conditions were stable and once the boat was trimmed, little would change for hours or even the whole day. We slowly made our way from chart to chart. Most people let the GPS do the lion's share of the work, but there's something reassuring about using old-fashioned navigation first. The numerous navigational beacons meant you could also travel easily at night. Sailing through the tropics at night is a really mind-blowing experience. The wind's warm, there's no sunburn to worry about. And navigation's pretty simple, it's just a question of keeping your eye out for the beacons, making sure you keep the green on your port and red on your starboard. Right. Now, anyone who knows the rules of the sea will understand why I refused to go to bed while Tom was at the helm. Small correction to be made here. Nothing too drastic. Now, there's a look that inspires confidence. Other vessels are always an issue, but we weren't going to bump into any islands or reefs, thanks largely to the channel markers and charts we had on board. But when James Cook did this trip, he had no idea what was ahead, 
All he could see was mile after mile of coral reef, preventing him from getting out into the ocean and safe water. Just his luck to get stuck inside the longest reef in the world. He was constantly searching for safe channels. He spent day after day in these waters looking for a way out. Relief came in the form of Lizard Island. Cook was such an unbelievable navigator. I don't have a love for Cook, or I didn't until we started studying and doing this trip because we were taught him at school and it was kind of a boring subject, but he was absolutely incredible. He had to use the lunar distance method, which was very difficult on a boat. But he saw Lizard Island off in the distance, climbed the mountain and saw a way out of the reef. And on this map to this day, it's still called Cook's Passage. Unfortunately, the direct route north doesn't include Lizard Island. Cape York has a huge notch in it, which requires a kind of L-shaped course. Fortunately, the winds late in the year are perfectly suited to this course. But boats coming the other way, well, they have to work much harder. The main navigational route heads due west, clipping Cape Melville, but basically staying well away from the coast. There are some interesting island groups in the area, including the Howick Group and the spectacular Flinders Island Group. It's got safe anchorages all over the place. It's a regular refuge for the prawn trawling fleets. You knew that if this place was a couple of thousand miles south of here, it'd have condominiums and beach houses all over the place. But there's nothing. It's quite special. From here, the majority of sailing was in relatively open water, with the odd sand key popping its head up. The rendezvous with the coast was two days away. But what a coast it is. Again, beautiful sand beaches that stretch for miles with unnamed creeks and crocodiles in clear water. And here, the earth starts to rise again to form a mountain range. The area also has some fascinating historical reminders of William Bly's epic voyage after the mutiny on the bounty such as Restoration Island, a turning point in one of the greatest survival stories of all time. And just north, a truly extraordinary place. The mighty Pasco River marks a part of Australia that barely rates a footnote in most books. It drains the largest lowland rainforest in the country. It is stunning. It is also remarkable that even today, the vast majority of Australians, including us until this year, do not even know it exists. A few more hours north and we could see the mouth of the Arakai, and then we arrived in the protected anchorages of Cape Grenville, known as Indian and Margaret Bays. Fishing would have to wait till tomorrow when the tide was right. In the meantime, we'd use our dinghy to explore the channels and coves. It's a magical part of the world, with clean sand, bright coral and blue water, and a dozen little islands. But there was something else. Every now and again, something strange would catch our eye off in the distance. What appeared to be snow-capped mountains. Now, they had to be salt or sand, but it was more than a little intriguing. And lunch was never going to be a problem. You see, the warm waters of this coast are home to the black-lipped oyster... They're easily picked out of the shallow waters, which kind of guarantees their freshness. This is one of the reasons we bought all those lemons back in Port Douglas. The other being it was about the only fruit we recognised. Two dozen later, and I was still going. Unfortunately, the restaurant only had one hammer and screwdriver, so I had to wait till the second sitting. The waters around here are full of brightly coloured tropical fish. We could see them when we were snorkelling, but landing a fly near them wasn't so easy. That was until Rob came up with an idea so stupid it might just work. Underwater fishing. You see, you'd spot the fish underwater with your mask and then you'd cast to it, let it sink and then strip it back. I guess we were eating too many oysters. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to perfect it, and we would have, because we had an important appointment to keep. At this point, we may have to explain something. 
In Australia, there is a horse race, the Melbourne Cup. It's known as the race that stops a nation. And it does, quite literally, on the first Tuesday in November. Well, today was the first Tuesday in November. So even up here, thousands of miles from anybody, we climbed to the highest vantage point we could find and stopped to listen to the running of the Melbourne Cup. We rigged up our little shortwave radio, strung out the aerial from a bush and tuned into Radio Australia. I had always aloof, a dead certainty. Tom had might and power. <laughs> Good luck, Tom. Might and power did win. Tom was up 25 bucks. It did occur to me that up here money means nothing and you'd have to go a long way to collect. Still, the lousy nag. We headed back to the boat. I had to do a few chores and Tom was intent on trying to vary our diet a little. After so many days at sea, eating nothing but seafood, you kind of get sick of it. Tell the truth, I'm sort of hoping I've hooked a cow here. Unfortunately, it wasn't a cow, it was a sucker fish. On the scale of fishing prestige, hooking one of these rates marginally above getting your fly hooked around the anchor rope. We took the dinghy back into the beach at Indian Bay. Hmm, nice and bouncy. Perfect. We could only enter the Yarrakai at high tide, which would be the next morning. So it was time to use one of these pristine beaches for another of Australia's great traditions. Beach cricket. I won the toss and elected to bowl. Now we decided we had to get each other out five times. So I opened with my trademark Jeff Thompson impersonation. To hard, genuine pace for the big man, squared him up. And then I brought on the medium pacer. Sneak, got him, yes, move on away. Oh, he's running in. Oh, he's taking his way back to Pavilion. It's all happening up here at Cape Grenville. Magnificent conditions too. Disappointing crowd. Unfortunately, after a while, I lost my length and Tom started to settle into his stride. Oh, I don't know what that was about. That was a crap ball. Oh, he's acting like a galar again. Man's a fool. As the game progressed, Tom started to hit me all over Cape York. So I'd switched to spin and my Shane Warne impersonation. I drifted one into his legs and then I delivered my flipper. Yes, got him, got him. Oh, he's acting like a galar again. The game progressed well into the afternoon. Tom was 3 for 67 at tea, and I was worn out. So it was then we decided to do some beach combing. Some of these beaches would be lucky to see anybody in a year, yet it's amazing what gets washed up on them. You find bottles, rope, bits of wood, and of course, thongs. We figured most thongs must be made up north in Asia and to save on shipping costs, the manufacturers don't use a ship. They just dump them in the ocean and let them float down. This one must have left sometime in the 70s. Later on, there was an appeal against the light by the bowler and Tom decided to rig up and make one more attempt to catch something different for dinner. It was a lazy time of day. Even the sun seemed to be taking its time getting down. We headed the short distance down the coast the next morning. We were finally going to go up the Yarrakai. The mouth of the river is pretty nondescript, but if you venture through the mouth, then behind the coastal dunes is a truly spectacular sight. We also got another glimpse of those snow-capped mountains. At its mouth, the Yarrakai has a big sandy bottom, surrounded by mangroves and dense forest. The best fishing tends to be at the mouth, but it's pretty tide-dependent. You've got to wait to the bottom of the low tide and fish the turn. 
and as this wouldn't be for another few hours, we decided to explore a little further upstream. The river began to narrow noticeably, so we decided to flick a few flies around and see if anything took. Soon after, something strange happened. Now, it's not often we put the rods away when we're up a river. In fact, it's never. But after five minutes, we both had the same thought. Let's stop fishing and keep exploring. Just the feel of the river and its never-ending twists and turns drew us further and further upstream. I think the idea that the never-ending bends had us hypnotised is going too far, but not by much. The desire to see what was around the next one was irresistible. It kept snaking its way inland and it's a prehistoric place. And something about it was just a little bit spooky. Even the idea that the engine would fail gave us a chill, and Prudence says we should have turned back, but we didn't. I'm not exactly certain how far we went upriver, a long way, that's for sure, but it was constantly intriguing and exciting. I guess it would be different if you're a botanist. You could probably name everything. But for us, it was strange to go to a place where each plant and fruit was one you've never seen before. Time eventually ran out and we headed back downstream. I guess the major difference between fresh and saltwater fly fishing, apart from the millinery, is presentation. It's the way you present the fly on the water. With uh, freshwater fishing, say something like trout, delicacy is really important. You have to just let the fly drop very gently down. If you splash it down on the water, chances are you'll send the trout running for cover. But up rivers like this, the, the fish seem to be more aggressive, more territorial. In fact, the best thing you can do is sort of slap the fly down quite hard and it, it brings, them, brings them out looking at it and attacking it and hopefully getting caught. These sort of saltwater fish are quite predatory. You just have to keep casting until the fly goes past their nose and then bang. The next hour went ballistic with just about every species of fish throwing themselves at our flies. Goldspot trevally, finger mark, mangrove jack. In fact, some of them became positively annoying. We kept one or two for dinner and then started heading back to cook. Only we made a detour. On the way down, we noticed a little creek, I guess more a tidal inlet, and decided to have a little wade while the tide continued to flow in. Now, if you think this looks crazy, you may be right, but we did check the clear water for crocs from the mangroves first. I guess on reflection it was crazy.
Now it was definitely time to head back. Oh, there was one more detour. We stopped at these huge sheer-sided sand dunes that run straight into the sea. They were made of probably the finest, whitest sand we'd seen on the whole trip. You'd think we'd get sick of this, wouldn't you? We come all this way and act the galah. We got this recipe from Roy Turner, one of the few people who lives up this way. He got it from some guy in Singapore. You put a bit of water in a wok and you put in your fish with ginger and Chinese mushrooms and soy sauce in on top of a rack. With a damp cloth around the lid, you've got yourself a perfect steamer. There's something special about cooking on the beach. There's also something special about being a thousand miles out of mobile phone range. Then throw in a few reminiscences about how we promised our loved ones we would never wait in crocodile water. Add some peanuts and a drink and life is pretty good. A sunset doesn't hurt either. The black spotted tusk fish was also excellent. Every now and again we come across a really good way of cooking fish. I reckon steam cooking any fish with ginger will produce magic. This was our farewell to the boat. You didn't think we were going to sail it back, did you? Nah. We had a clever arrangement with a charter skipper. We'd fly him up in a light plane and then we'd take the plane back. It'd land on the beach if the tide was low or a rudimentary airstrip on a nearby island if it was high. Not that we could find an airstrip. We found a strip of dirt where someone had put a windsock but nothing where a plane would land. Well, we said we'd give it an hour and then go back to the boat and try radioing. But after 20 minutes, sure enough. Now that plane has to have brakes. Either that or it's four-wheel drive. It was when the plane taxied back towards us that it really sank in. The trip was over. It was a hard place to leave, but a few things made it easier. A brilliant sunny day made the colours of the islands and reefs stand out. And also, we flew over and got a really good look at the snow-capped mountains that had been intriguing us for days. The snow was, of course, sand, but nothing could prepare us for the extraordinary nature of this landscape from a few hundred feet up. The landscape stretched for as far as the eye could see. And between the dunes were hundreds of lakes and waterways. And we couldn't help thinking that maybe there were some fish in those waters. And maybe the odd river. But then, there's always a river somewhere. <laughs> 